Monday, June 14th meeting of the Pembroke School Committee to order. Um, we do have an adjustment to the agenda, which is on the superintendent's report, item C, consideration of acknowledgement of the Town Memorial Day committee gift to the uh, Pembroke High School Music Department. Uh, but before we get into any of the, um, pardon me, uh, before we get into the, the agenda, we want to recognize a few people. Um, it's the end of the school year, I think, brings joy to uh, just about every one of the kids, actually, every one of the kids brings a little bit of sadness to the parents who have the, who have the home, but it also brings um, some sadness to us because of a joyful occasion to some of the people who've given a lot of service to our, to our district. Um, so at the urging of um, our superintendent, we are taking this opportunity to honor um, each of our retirees. And we'll, I'd like to call them up individually. I'm going to start with the first one because I still don't believe it's true. Okay. Um, and I'll just read that plaque to It'll be similar for all the other ones. But I've been thinking this plaque could be, I don't know, we could have changed the year for probably any time after the beginning of the, the millennium. But it actually does say the Pembroke School Committee recognizes, I can't even say Dr. Jo Joseph Alton, Arsenal Jr. I can't even say the whole name. I couldn't call it that. Um, for as many years of service to the students of Pembroke for, on June 30th, 2016. <laughs> still, you're still coming to graduation every year. <laughs> you have to. What did you say, Michael? <laughs> I was actually going to retire like seven years ago. Seven? A couple of people who were. I don't know, you weren't. Who were not and named said, why do you go to Dr. Dr. Hackett's interview, and if you'd like to be here, maybe stay on. I want to see how those people were, but <laughs> Okay. St. Black for Diane Holbrook. Mm -hmm. no, I with the class of 
you have another retirement? There's no plan. There's no plan. No. Uh, a little bit different, just so she can count the days till she wants to come back to cover a high school. You know, I think this is what happens when you work with middle schoolers and then take them into high school. It deserves. I thought I went to college. Now that's it. <laughs> 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 like, what was that? Boy Meets World. Yeah. It could be just there, Mr. Feeney. Yeah, Mr. Feeney. Uh, yeah. Don't go with them. But uh, Peg, thank you so much for for everything you've done for us. The high school, the middle school, back to the high school. It's been just everything all over again. Thank you for a wonderful time. Thank you. boxes all over the summer, <laughs> and um, we didn't even know what was in those boxes. <laughs> we were folding them, and people have not only, like the, the workshop that we just had in May, they not only were telling, like the Pearson rep, what was involved in some of the things, but they also have a really strong grasp of how to use a workshop model, which is just really exciting, and um, I'm just really proud 
and it's pretty consistent all through grade one. It's just very impressive. It speaks to the dedication and um, what our teachers really care about. So I know we could have filled this table with like a whole audience of people of uh, K6, and it was, it's very exciting. So I'm going to turn yeah, it over to Anne. Yeah, I think I think the teachers are the yeah, ones who funny. want it, are going to speak. They're going to speak to things that they learned, what it meant to them this year, how their teaching has changed. Um, so I teach fifth grade here at North, um, and I was talking to one of my colleagues this afternoon, and they said, "You know, what, what do you really think I should talk about?" Um, and we decided that basically there were definitely great pieces of it. Um, we've grown to love it. Um, it started off a little rocky. It started off that the kids were a little bit different as far as um, the vocabulary wasn't quite in line with what we've had before. Um, the expectations were different, especially with the, the fact that it's getting them into the second gen, or the next generation um, test model. Um, so with the assessments, they were difficult to start with. Um, the kids have gotten better with them. Um, they're very language-based, which for children who have difficulties with that, that's kind of a consideration for next year. Um, so the expectations are different. It doesn't actually take, not all lessons are one day. A lot of times it takes two days to get through a lesson, um, and it depends on the kids. So the pacing is definitely a focus for year two for us to decide what can we maybe condense some of the lessons, what can we pair up with others, um, and probably doing maybe a little bit more like pre-testing to see what do they know already coming in and what can we do a quick review on and then go. Um, the, it was the way that we felt when we looked at it in the fall, it was um, so broad as far as just being able to keep the pacing for the year. So now we've got a year under our belt, we can, we can kind of go, okay, what can we do now just to make it better for next year? Can I ask a question on that? Do you want to talk? Sure. Um, based on that, when you try, when, when everybody comes back, um, and I, we know some gets lost over the summer, is there going to be any type of different summer work for the kids that they haven't done in the past? But on the math packet, does yeah. that look different? So, in the in the book itself, there's a step up to the next grade. So I'm having um, my accelerated students, and then the other three fifth grade teachers are also going to do it, um, that they're sending it home as, this is what we recommend you do. We're not telling them they have to do it, but we're recommending that they do it. So I'm, I'm actually going to take it out and staple it together and throw a cover letter on it and send that bad boy home so that hopefully parents will see it and say, let's do this and let's keep up with it. Is that going to be consistent, though? I mean, I, that's also the area that there is. It going to be consistent amongst of all the schools? We actually um, talked as, as this first year, not we made a conscious effort not to do a consistent. We're also looking for a technology piece in the summer because the problem with the packets is if you have a parent who knows the answer and you can get immediate feedback, but if you're just doing a packet and no one's correcting it. So the technology makes a whole lot yeah, more sense, sense to get that immediate. Yeah. And so sense. we, the principals, and Mary Beth, and Mark Duffy, and Aaron, we all meet at least once a month as a curriculum team. And that's one of the, our big goals for next year for our agenda, to really figure out the summer piece that sure. makes more sense consistently across our district sure. and gives kids immediate feedback. Sure. So the best thing would be for us to find some sort of adaptive technology. <coughs> so when kids are working and they get something wrong, it goes back to what they didn't um, actually get yeah. Yeah. right. So that it sort of takes us with them. Yeah. Um, and I think that we would have better luck with that in terms of the gap and also recommending minutes of time doing it instead of like having a packet where you don't know, what they come in, they're already in the hole, there's already yeah. a problem. Yeah. And just to piggyback off that, um, part of the reason that we made a conscious effort to not be consistent this year across the schools is because of, to piggyback kind of off of what Dave Summergrad and Ben and Jerry analogy is, um, there is different de um, demographic of kids at each of the different schools, so, and um, we're really looking at what works best this year with the new program and the unfolding, so in order to support the students and the staff, um, we, made, we made it so that it was 
fester for the kids within the schools, and then looking to next year, as Mary Beth said, making a conscious effort of being consistent across schools that meets all the kids' different needs with the technology piece or an at home piece or whatever is best fit for us. Perfect sense. And as far as the consistency is concerned, as far as the technology, um, one of the things that Mary Beth kind of has spearheaded was the whole idea of, you know, teachers giving their feedback on what websites and apps are most useful. Not just nice to have, but which ones are they using in the classroom. So when they go home over the summer, they're very familiar with those, and then we can actually start tracking the progress over time. What does this summer look like professional development-wise to get more people, you know, up to speed or learning from each other, right? Because I mean, it kind of comes to the, what's the best practice across what's worked well and what hasn't worked well. There's a massive curriculum project going on in math this summer. Um, there are representatives from each grade level, um, who's being led by Mark Duffy. So they're working on a number of different things in terms of creating three benchmark assessments and then the lessons that go with them. And in addition to that, trying to come to grips with the definition of fluency, which is really a critical um, component of sort of our work going forward so that we as a district have a um, unified understanding of what fluency means. Is it speed? Is it accuracy? Is it you know, depth of understanding? There's all kinds of things that go with that. So there's a lot of work getting done this summer in terms of math, um, math and inclusion. And there's also a plan for, because it's just a representative group, which is a lot of this summer, but taking one of, we have a lot of insert uh, staff development days at the beginning of the year, which is, we wanted that. It was perfect. So that we, you know, you don't want to go off and do something in the summer and then bring it and deliver it and unveil it to the rest. We really want to engage people in the work. So we're going to be using one of those professional development days to engage everybody in the summer yeah. PD. Mostly at the grade level teams. So District-wide grade levels are having more and more opportunity to work together, collaborate, develop. That's what the, that's what the teachers want to do, and it makes sense. So just put it in perspective, to do a which is great because people at home get to see what we're, more about what we're doing. Put in perspective, how many people do you have to get going in the same direction for some for a, for a new curriculum? Well, we have 20 people doing them, uh, 20 or 21 people doing the math, and then similar projects going on in the humanities with an ELA social studies component. That have to get to how many other people? We uh, have, well, we have like um, 35 mm -hmm. at our school. You must have a boat and number. Yeah. And, so uh, yeah, close to 100, 100 people have to be, yeah. be trained and become yeah. first on. And we already set aside time in addition to the professional development days, a couple of days for teachers to come back together and look at those assessments mm -hmm. after they're given so that they can <coughs> express in their mind what's working, what's not working, how do we have to adjust. Actually, think it's so good to hear about the curriculum work being done. It's because we did so much, but five years ago, so maybe six years ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I mean we did all that drill down work and insert of everything else and I feel like you know like, we implemented every ran with it and we almost have it for fresh. Yeah. And a lot of so I think it's and it makes sense because the standards are all different yep. things have changed. So the technology's better. I actually do have a question on the technology and I think it's gonna be a naive one so bear with me. But I remember seeing in a lot of the presentations as well as you know, even as you got into sort of middle school, high school, Pearson has a pretty good technology component, right? Good websites where you can go out and you can check things, you get immediate feedback, that type of thing. Can, and again, this is the naive part of it. Can we not use that as part of the summer program to get that immediate feedback? It's that you're a lot of um, gaming. It's a lot of practice work. So it's not exactly <laughs> what Mary Duffy yeah, actually adapted that really puts you on a track and addresses your needs. Okay. It isn't, it, that so is, it doesn't say, hey, you're weak here. And it would be great. I can't understand why Pearson isn't adding that yeah. to it. But yeah. that it doesn't even need to say that you're weak. Like, really good program all for a student, it just automatically Yeah, and, and people who need enrichment yeah. can also have that enrichment piece, yes. too, because you're kind of the tracks Got where it. you are. Good. In the past for that, we've used um, Sunny Island. And we, still, we still have access to Sunny Island at North, um, and that's actually where we draw um, our morning work from, our questions for our morning work for our kids, um, to be able to have them practicing all year, the same skills that we started off with and we're starting with that. Um, here's the, some of the problem that we had spoken to the reps about was the fact that if they're using the online piece for quizzing, um, there are different ways that some of the questions could be answered. There are mm -hmm. different possibilities and parameters. Um, and if the student doesn't put in the exact parameter that the 
program expects, then it creates an issue. And if the teacher doesn't go back and check yeah. it, then it's just marked wrong. Mm -hmm. And it could be something like um, writing an expression with a vary. Mm -hmm. You can write it three different ways, mm -hmm. but the program's got one. Yeah. Yeah. And what's nice is that our professional development sessions, um, the PSM reps were present, so they actually took that information back. And because this is a brand new product, hopefully they're going to start refining that over time, and we're going to see you know just better outcomes for the technology piece. So, yeah. through some of the uh, PD workshops that we had, the PSM reps sort of led us through what would be a <coughs> typical schedule and um, enlightened a lot of us because nine months ago, many of us were really overwhelmed when we started the program because it was a different language. The vocabulary was a lot different than what the children came in with with their prior knowledge. So that was a piece of it that kind of led to their math anxiety. Then they led us through even rethinking our teaching. Often we would state what the goals or the objectives were for the lesson. Do a mini lesson first and then send the kids off to kind of work things out. But it retrained my thinking too in terms of they start now with the solve and share, and I can access that through the technology piece, project that on the board, and there's an audio component of it too. And it gives them sort of their problem of the day. So prior to a mini lesson, it sort of taps into okay, what, what do they already come with for their knowledge on possibly applying it to this problem? And um, we just do a quick assessment using whiteboards where the children hear what the problem is, they can see it, they can attempt to solve it, and then they can come on up and either share it with the whole class or do a turn and talk. And quickly, within weeks, um, it was amazing to see how the language that as teachers we thought, oh my goodness, this is so overwhelming, it just became part of their everyday learning. And whether they would say, um, oh, well, I use compensation to solve this problem, or I use an open number line, or I just, I just, you know, calculated it, whatever it was, there might have been seven or eight different ways that they all came to the same solution, as opposed to the old way of thinking, I might have said, well, this is the problem, and this would be one way to do it. Now, here's a similar problem, you solve it based on my own yeah. way, but instead it has them initiate their ideas for problem solving, and then it kind of leads into another piece, the um, visual learning, which is another video, and it's engaging for the kids. This is an era that they're really um, technology dependent. And it includes um, animated cartoon figures of a robot. And then there are also children that are animated too. And they quickly found names within their workbooks. And they can name them when they come up. They have different voices and different personalities. They present a problem. What I like about it is you can, it, the video, um, it, it pauses, causes that natural then wait and think time for them to solve a piece of it, share what they think, and then you can continue the video. Um, and we do that on a daily basis before they want to do the independent practice or start their workshop model. And it's just been great to see their perseverance grow, as opposed to the children at the beginning of the year might have actually um, created a hole right in their paper just to make that problem literally disappear <laughs> to the kids that now are really seeing it. Right way. And sometimes, even if you get it wrong, you're still learning because you're finding out the mistakes. What's been the feedback from parents, positive and negative, and especially the negative, what have we learned from it? I think for first grade, a big piece has been um, the language component, and you know, coming in and half the class are not readers yet. And so, you know, working through that with them um, and when you're sending homework home. Um, there's a real piece where, you know, sometimes we get a um, note back and we just really just didn't understand what this was. So there's, I think, that piece of it. But overall, I feel like um, parents have been positive. I've had a lot of really great conversations with them about it. Um, my kids, like you said, are much more um, comfortable, you know, problem solving and, and not, you know, feeling like they can approach something and if they're not sure what to do, they, they, dig in and, and you get the perseverance, whereas before they would quit and just wait for somebody to say, oh, you know, this is how you can solve it. So, um, yeah, and the parents are seeing that at home as well. There's much less like hand-holding um, as the year went on with working with the homework. So, that's been, that's been helpful. Catherine found an app, too. I think it's Bounce. Yep. Bounce yep. Bounce app with Pearson. And on the top of a homework page, there'll be icons. 
and a parent, um, so we share that a conference time can load this app on the device. And then they can scan the icons on the top of the page, and it links to the visual learning video that the kids saw at school that day. So then the kids can kind of sort of have fullness of the teaching to their parents to say, this is what we learned in class, is sort of what the language means, because it, it is a lot different than the way most of us learn. And it's child friendly, so as adults, it builds our confidence that child our children at home. <coughs> And I have to say that, I mean, I think PR is always needed to help parents communicate. One of the things that I was so excited is last week, the first grade team had done a math fair in our school. It was in a cafeteria. 100% of the first grade parents were there. And us, a lot of them were both mom and dad or grandma, or <laughs> aunt or whoever. And it, this was the best piece about helping parents understand what this math is all about. It started out when they had a math journal. It was called Math Fair. They started out with a math journal, and they showed their parents the stra different strategies they had learned this year and how to solve problems. So it wasn't like a one-size, like how we learn math, mm -hmm. one-size-fits-all strategy. And kids were so, they practiced with teachers before, so they were very articulate about these strategies. And then at the end, they actually made some of the math games that they used in the, that they used all year in the classroom to take home in the summer, and they it was great. Parents were cutting and you know gluing and putting them together, and they all left with a nice little bag with math fun to do. But it was again a total in a fun way understanding about what was really important this year in first grade, and then how can you carry how can you help at home? What are some things you could do over the summer? You know, one of the things I liked when we saw it the first couple times was the emphasis on problem solving versus just learning math facts. Right? My older two kids, we sat with flashcards or with the sheets and over and over again, right? So you went through. So to me, problem solving is a lot of, you know, maybe with half a generation above my kids, you get them out of college and they, that's the biggest issue they have is problem solving. They're smart, but they just have never done that. Where are we seeing? Are we seeing the benefit of this in other classes? What's some of the, the stories you can tell? So my students um, have gotten fabulous at giving each other feedback that they feed off of each other. One of them will say something, and then the next one will, oh yeah, I did it this way, and then you can add to that. And um, they're just they're so good now at complimenting each other. Or you know what? I think if you look at it this way this is where you went wrong. And they, but they've gotten really nice about being able to correct each other, as opposed to, no, you're wrong. <laughs> you're doing it right. And the language just around the entire program has changed that. Uh, so that's been a really good um, side effect of it. And it's, it's leaked into my social studies class, too. Um, we've been doing the revolution, and one of the kids said that the wrong historical figure did some, something. And one of the kids goes, I respectfully the product itself comes with the STEM extension activities. Have any of you guys used the STEM pieces with it? Or not? not this year, but I'm looking at it. Can I lead into my last question? I don't want to comment, but I, we have one more. <laughs> Sorry. What, what's, what's next? For this, obviously, besides just going next year and improving K through six and or expanding whatever we do there, what's next? Do we take this to the middle school? Because I know we talked about there was an extension to this to seven eight. So the um, seven and eight teachers this summer have professional development time too. They're going to pilot three different programs next year, so they're going to need this summer to like, figure out which areas they're going to use. And one of the things they'll be looking at is the Envision product for seven and eight, which would be a nice fit. But there are a couple of other programs that also might fit that need, so they want to take a look at all three of those products next year um, in, in different times, and then after next year, we'll be making a recommendation for a new product for 7th and 8th grade. But as far as continuity, the product that we use in 7th and 8th right now is currently a Pearson product, so there's... Okay, there's yeah. so the, the, especially the 6th six, 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 grade going up to 7th. Right, it's not going to be... also set aside professional development, and sound like a professional development crazy person, but um, for 6th grade teachers to um, meet with 7th and 8th grade teachers because we want them, we tried to get them into classrooms and it became very difficult in the spring. Um, and people weren't really ready for visitors in the fall, you know, so it just sort of became kind of a, a difficult obstacle. But 
we really want to maintain some of the things that the um, K-6 teachers are doing in terms of the number talks and the way that students are identifying their problem-solving skills and maintaining that momentum in the seventh and eighth grade. So we're thinking that even if the elementary teachers could share with the middle school teachers some of those best strategies or best practices, then maybe we can sort of hang on to that momentum for for next year at least, and then we'll be piloting something and then adopting something. So it should take it does take a little while, but I, I think that it, you know it's going to have some really I think really big benefits for students. It was a big investment of mostly people's time. Um, well, they were. So that's the group, right? Yeah, there. <laughs> I mean, we we appreciate it. Um, I know the enthusiasm has continued to show, so it's all it's all been a good thing. Can you ask Absolutely. The same question again, but I I wasn't clear. Um, it's it's exciting for us to hear, and thank you, Bonnie, for taping this. Um, I hope everybody watches. Um, excited to be able to say to parents, you can do this too. Um, being a parent and always wondering, how do I teach my kids this math stuff and where does it carry over? And I love the fact that they use the language across the board. Um, since it's been decided not to, um, to do everything the same this year in terms of messaging, what is the plan for let's go into summer encouraging parents that we do have a plan school by school how are we going to communicate? Yeah, so the, I think the overall guidance is a recommended number of minutes. Um, we're putting together a brochure, we'll say, of potential websites and apps for kids to use. And instead of saying, here's your packet, we're recommending you know, whether it's five minutes a day of math and five minutes a day of reading. Um, but the, the time allotment would be the same across the schools. Um, in addition to the brochure of websites and apps, certain teachers like Heidi are using the kind of step up piece to the to the um, individual market. And there's other teachers doing a kind of different approaches. I think the, the continuity piece for us is the recommended amount of times we've done that and doing each day over the summer. And I think in terms of continuity for our messaging is to reassure, constantly reassure. Of course we always reassure our kids and you can do that because you're in the classroom right now. I always wonder about parents and grandparents in that home knowing that you know, it's maybe August 1st, and they they might need a reminder or a broadcast email that says we haven't forgotten you, it's summer, but um, there's still learning going on. So I'm just uh, concerned about the continuity for our message. And I think it sounds like we're getting a plane. Yes. That's good. I think it's funny because this is now our new map. That one we we up our patch, we're like, oh, is that new map? This is ours. So this is really new map. <laughs> <laughs> we use a bounce page app at my house because my husband math is not really his strong suit, and I'll often come home and listen to my first grader teaching my husband how to tell time on the clock. Or you know, so it's actually interesting to hear back. I think one of my favorite things we've done here at this table of envision is. Was it Megan that brought the number talk that we watched for the first grade mm -hmm. and the amount of vocabulary that they were using? And that was, I think, in November or so. Yeah, it was that amazing. Was right. so. Now, this has, been, this has been great. We're appreciative of taking time out of your evenings to come in here um, and explain it more. This is, this is really good. Good luck this summer. You know, all the work we'll be looking forward to putting you on the agenda, probably for around October, maybe. It'll be kind of a tech focused one because we'll be in a place that we're yeah, more yeah, yeah, I think, you know what, when we, when we build out now, if we could add now, I guess it'll end up being probably close to nine or ten because we have the other ones that will drop off. Mm -hmm. But if we could put this back on for, does October make the most sense? So it'll get you through summer work, get you into the first okay. month. Mm -hmm. I don't really think September is. is there are some yeah, 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 really just really doesn't work. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll order the same good weather for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. By the way, is there going to be a budget impact on anything that comes out this year? Like that technology thing coming out of that summer work? It's a great time to bring it up in that October November time frame. Is there a point where we're going to the next fiscal year budget planning? Like, how do you get it on the priority list? So, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Okay. Um, there are no communications in the schedule. Field schedules are circulating along the assignment, so we get a bit of paper.
and anticipation of approval of the school committee minutes of May 25th. Yeah. Move to accept the school committee meeting minutes of May 25th as presented. Yeah. Okay. Motion by Patrick, second by Jimmy. Any further discussion? Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? To be clear, this is for 2016. Yeah. Is it 2016? What do you know? No, it's 15 on the agenda. I just want to make sure it's clear. 16 on the minutes. That's okay. Yeah, 16 on the minutes. Now that I try to turn back time all the time. <laughs> it just doesn't work. Okay. Uh, technology update. So I'm so disappointed that the calls not here this evening, but I did have an opportunity to have a conversation with them prior to radio. So um, I think initially we had thought that we would be in a place where everybody, where I would be giving you kind of some of the um, recommendations from our tech audit. Um, but I'm not. <laughs> um, so there was a little bit of. I thought know, I'd give it to you, but now we're not. But so there was a little bit of um, a roadblock at the beginning that I had spoken with you guys about just as far as um, remote access for the company. That was solved. Um, the, the problem that we have run into is the survey. So you'll remember um, the audit was originally broken up into two pieces, two phases. The first phase was a network diagram. That phase is complete. We have a comprehensive network diagram um, as well as recommendations from the consultant on. Um, continuing the server virtualization project that we had started last year, um, as well as some adjustments to our, our content filter, which I think is something we get a, a lot of feedback from both students and staff about. Um, I think those pieces, the, the server virtualization piece, that information was very timely for us in the sense that when we start to talk about um, year-end planning and what summer will look like for the techs, um, they have recommended that there's three additional servers that we have as physical servers for virtualization, so we're going to move forward. Um, on that piece. The second phase, which was the phase that I think we were the most excited about, was just kind of an audit of, of our inner workings and um, you know incorporating the feedback from students and staff and, and moving forward in a way that people felt more comfortable with the connectivity and access. Um, you're not going to believe this, but there's just been limited responses to the survey. Um, the survey's been open about a week and a half, and we have 40 total responses, which is um, far fewer than we had been hoping for, considering the level of frustration around um, technology that you guys definitely heard during the search process and that we hear day in and day out. Um, so we've extended the window on the survey to go through this Friday, and we've kind of integrated needing to fill out the survey as part of the checkout process for teachers as well as um, for students. Um, but from the surveys that we've gotten back, the responses kind of focus around three areas, areas connectivity, um, in the sense of reliability, everyone agrees that we can connect in all five of our buildings, but can we do it consistently um, seems to be what our issue is. Uh, classroom support, um, you've heard me talk a lot at this level about how small our tech department is. I think that teachers' frustration sometimes centers around the fact that we have two techs that are split, spread across five buildings, um, and there's not any, I would say, in-building expertise or access for somebody to help within the building. We talk a lot about um, admin access, access versus regular access and who has um, those type of permissions. Um, the other piece is, uh, amongst that same line is in classroom support is teachers' comfort level with technology. Um, we will remember last year we had Sarah McNulty, who was the techno technology integration specialist at the elementary level. People could not say enough great things about how helpful it was to have somebody whose focus was to help them integrate technology into their classroom. Um, we did not have that position this year, and I think some of our teachers, not that they were relying on her, but were just, are just reluctant to, to change their practice, given the fact that the access is not so consistent or reliable. Um, and the other overwhelming response was about our platform choice, um, the choice to use Office 365 versus Google Apps for Education. Um, I think that was something that we knew was going to come up, and I think uh, administratively we've talked a lot about whether Microsoft was the right choice to um, move to towards a platform or, was, or whether it was driven by a certain preference um, of administration. I think we're going to spend some time this summer looking at Google um, and looking at the applications. I think Mary Beth is probably a little bit, I see Bonnie smiling. <laughs> um, Mary Beth is probably a little bit more well versed in, in, in the teacher end of it, but Google just has so much more to offer and all of it's free. Um, I think. Oh, I'm sorry, it's right. It's free. Yeah. Uh, we like that. Um, and there's there's a lot of excitement amongst teachers for those those products. I think when they go to professional development or they talk to their colleagues, everybody's using Google Drive and Google Classroom, and we are not. And so I think for them, it's it's 
kind of a hindrance. Um, we, when we were looking for a audit company, we did speak with a couple that had some expertise in Google that I'd like to go back to and, and kind of have a more lengthy conversation on um, is this even possible? What does it look like? If you know, we've spent a lot of energy um, getting everybody to Microsoft um, to, uh, to use Office 365 and OneDrive. Um, is it worth the effort to, to then make this shift? Um, I don't know if there's anything you want to talk about. I was just thinking that I don't see why we can't have both. Many districts have both. Yeah. yeah, so I think it's a conversation around what, what we support. Um, so, you know, we've given students 7 through 12 user IDs and passwords for Office 365. Do we do the same for Google? How much of it um, with a three person tech department is manageable for us? It's okay to use both as long as we have standardization over we're using this for this and this for that, right? Yeah. Because uh, if, you, if you allow people to make the choice that in, within the same either grade level or content area, um, secondary level, I'm afraid that what you'll have is a kid will go from one class to another yeah. mm -hmm. and you'll be using you know, Office 365 here and Google Docs over there. Not that it's a bad thing, but if we don't have, if we lose consistency, I, I think that would be frustrating yeah, to the kids. I, but I think that there's, there are adaptives in between those two platforms. I don't think, I think Google Docs is where they live, actually. I don't think it's a hard thing for them. And I think learning the Microsoft is also an important thing, but both those companies are, they're infused in everybody's company, mm -hmm. right? So they're either going to be using one of those platforms. So I think exposure both is a great thing if we can afford that. Mm -hmm. so yeah, no, I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a bad thing to have both. I just think that we just have to be careful about how we roll it. Uh, that's that's where we start. You start to get the support issue, yes. and just again, because there's a there's the learning curve as the kids learn it, and they're learning the technology and trying to learn the subject. It could become which which is what are we trying to focus on? Yeah. That, would be, that would be my concern, uh, probably more as a parent than anything. Um, and so, not, Okay. Do, you, do, you, do you use Google Docs at all? I do. I, I, so, yeah, there'll be times we can't use it at work. But I, you know, some of the. That sounds like here. A little bit different. I live in a little different regulated industry. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but we use, you know, I use Google Docs with like friends or organizations right. that are part of them. Yeah, right. it's easy way to, to share documents to the best. Yeah. Um, but then in my day-to-day -day work, I have to use everything in the Microsoft suite. That's what I mean. Which, I, so absolutely, I get learning both, and I, I agree with it. Um, and I use Google Drive and um, all that, personally, all that other stuff. It's just one of those things, it's just, if it becomes too much and too difficult, I think that's where it beca could become tougher for the, for the, yeah. I, I'm, you know, in, I am concerned about the support, but I'm less because a lot of the support is being self-support. The kids generally know more than something. And we've talked a lot about not rolling out so fast or, or initiatives that we can't support. So I think you know, spending some time over the summer looking at what does it really entail from mm -hmm. a, an infrastructure support as well as you know uh, professional development for teachers, um, because oftentimes the student knows more about the platform than the teacher. Well, that, so. that's I guess part of like we can Google Docs, we can have Microsoft. You know, we can have lots of sort of devices, and everybody can have all the technology in their hand. But if you can't connect, and if it doesn't work when it's time to do the lesson, it's all kind of useless, right? And that's, I think, to your point on the connectivity, has been frustrating from a teacher perspective. Right? It's been frustrating from a parent perspective, from a student perspective. It's incredibly frustrating. And that's what I'm trying to figure out. And I, I'm not sure if the network diagram is ultimately going to get us there because really what that's just saying is this is what it all looks like, I think, anyway. This is what it all looks like. We just have everything connected together. What do we have to do? I mean, we laid the fiber, right, in order to get the speeds to the buildings. But what do we actually have to do in the buildings to truly fix the connectivity issue? So it's actually the connectivity issue is mislabeled. It is not what I would consider to be a connectivity issue. We laid the fiber, we've put, I can safely say the middle school and the high school are truly wireless buildings at the elementary level. It's a little bit more difficult because yeah. of the construction thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we did it in a way that we thought that one classroom, could, two, two classrooms could share a sure. hotspot. That's not working. So there's definitely an additional investment in hotspots or, or wireless hotspots at the elementary level. At the secondary level, it's not connectivity. It's a, I think it's a philosophical conversation about what BYOD means. So, so bring wait, your own how device. do we solve that, though? 
I mean, I, just, we've been, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm actually not trying to push on you too hard, but just mm -hmm. philosophically, if we think about this as a district, right? And this is something that's having a massive effect on day-to-day -day learning. And we've talked about a philosophical difference, I personally, right? I think we've got to end the philosophical right. difference, and we just have to say, this is what it's going to be, and we're on board or not on board. Yes, so thing, that right? is what so our next step forward. is, is defining what environment and what things students should have access to while in our buildings, right. and then that becomes the policy. It's no longer bring your own device, but when you walk in the front door, your device becomes a Pembroke device until you leave. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah. I think we've done a lot of research in surrounding communities on what their um, policies are, and the consulting firm that we're, firm that we're working with has works with college campuses. I like it to a college campus. Yeah. It should um, feel yeah, like when yeah, you get yeah. you know to UMass, you can get on UMass's website, and then you leave. Sure. Um, so I'll say right now, if I open BYOD, I won't be able to do but, it. But that's not actually what that's yeah. So that BYOD is really our guest network. Yeah. And that it's just because we're calling it BYOD, you're assuming a student is using it to access something yeah. educationally driven. And that's not really what it's for. It's yeah. really just for surfing the internet. It's not, you can't get on power schools, you can't get on the right, 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 right. And I think that's where the frustra frustration happens. It's not that they don't have access to get on the internet, it's just that we have filtered in a way for them by making It's almost impossible to do anything when you're there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah would that be ready? Yes, right yes. That is, I think, the first place where our energy is focused because we're not going to get any momentum or build any buy-in totally if agree. we can't get rid of that I, I frustration. Totally agree. So, um, Can I just add one more thing to what I think we need to put on the short-term to-do list? Um, and I, and I, I know the audit didn't do it. Can we get some type of penetration test done on the network? Because if we're going to go and open it up more, which I think is the right thing to do, we also need to understand how this can leave us exposed. So if you're starting adding devices, it becomes a security issue, and you have personal private information. No, so there is a piece of the audit that does comment on that. Yeah, just usually they can run a penetration test where they try different hacks to get in, and they can tell you where your weaknesses exist. And then, Aaron, as, as we move forward with this, and I think this is an awesome start, by the way. I mean, it's, we're fast. It's a slow start. No, I feel like it's actually, though, I, don't, I, don't, I, I think it's okay because I'd rather take our time now and really figure out what do we have to do to solve the problem and not put a band aid over the problem, but kind of go deep. And I think that's part of what I really like about this is we're pulling in external expertise, we're marrying them with internal expertise to truly solve the business issue as opposed to put a band-aid on something until next year or whatever. But I guess, will this then lead us to sort of amend our hardware plan, our technology plan, so, our sort of yep. needs analysis, that kind of thing? Later on, we talk a little bit about, so what you got, what this precipitated this was the, the need and, and the desire for a, a comprehensive three-year tech plan. Yep. Um, and I think when we talked about what that would entail, it entails a replacement cycle, it, it entails a roadmap, it entails all of those pieces. Um, with the way that the next piece I talked about the summer work that we're kind of looking to do this summer with administrators and with teachers, um, my expectation is to bring to you a comprehensive tech plan in October yep. um, that includes all of those pieces, so we feed into the long range. I think that's the fall. I, mean, I think it's too late. That's my comment is going to be again in September mm -hmm. because if we need to get an article for the fall time meeting for capital items, mm -hmm. we're going to. Um, so uh, September, I think. It would be difficult so, in the sense that the piece that's missing from our current tech plan is staff buy-in. And so in order to give them, in addition to the group that, that self-identifies over the summer, some kind of voice into it, I think you need the month I, of September. Can I, can I ask, let me ask a question a little bit differently. Is it possible for us to get conceptually what you're proposing with, or you're working with the teachers on, the staff on, so that we can take that and figure out, and quantify what that would mean? And then so if we have to put an article in the yeah, article, we know what the article finalize that early October for the what is it for the week of October town meeting? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's easier. Yeah. And then yeah. yeah, so we would probably need to put the September placeholder down, and we put the October placeholder. And I don't want to totally jump ahead so you can tell me stuff, but Sorry. when <laughs> we when, when we start talking about some of those things, is are we going to do sort of a lease by? Type of view too, because at this point, it makes sense to lease. Correct. I think we've talked about it a couple times now, but I think we're finally in the financial place where that makes the most sense. 
to just kind of sustain an overall year-over-year -year investment in technology. And sh can we also look at or consider um, put within the support role, is there a model that includes something on a contract basis for peak periods? Do you staff up in the month of September with a one-month contractor? And then if you're going to roll something out later in the year, again, use labor that way. So there's a bit of a collective bargaining issue with that. Okay. But, but even if you use them, okay. We have, as, as we have in the past, kind of filled it with that role. Um, and I think since it, we are in a negotiation cycle, I think it's a good time to talk about it. I'm just saying, I'm not saying that, times. yeah, but it's, I mean, it's you much more. You can have integration services with that type of issue. If right. you're integrating and using your hardware and your equipment or your software and that type of thing. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Just whether you use it for professional, but whatever it is, mm -hmm. it's just not contract based. If it turns out to be more money or as much money as a full time person, then you hire a person. I'm not trying to spend an extra money and try to see if there's a more efficient or effective way to do it. Sorry, that's okay. So, so running parallel to the, the audit that's been happening, um, we've been doing work as an administrative team. So um, the SLT, which is our larger administrative group, the strategic leadership team, which includes the department heads, um, the assistant principals, and those pieces, have been working to identify our summer work. Um, I think we have two meetings in to this topic and identify the three areas that we think need the most focus this summer and obviously technology is one of them. Um, we've done some work kind of identifying our strengths and weaknesses as a, as a group. Um, and within that work, what I've asked them to do is identify a weakness that they would like to work on over the summer. Um, I listed out for you on the sheet some of the weaknesses. They are what I would anticipate them to be, faculty reluctance, limited tech support. Um, my expectation is to come out of the summer with each of the three areas we have identified to have three strategic objectives and a work plan that goes with each of them to be presented to the teachers at the start of school. Um, bigger picture, my hope is that those three areas and in, in strategic initiatives become goals that I have for myself, that you guys have for a committee, and then build themselves into a three-year strategic plan. Um, the other piece that's kind of outstanding right now is that um, tech support liaison model that we talked about during the budget cycle. Um, cover your ears, Patrick. We talked about it being a stipend position at each of the buildings. Um, I think that's really a need. I think having somebody <coughs> on site every day, whether they're the teacher in the room next to you or they're somebody um, offering a, a short class after school on you know, something great that they've used, um, I think it's really important to build some building based expertise. I think giving you um, a potential job description to take a look at. Um, obviously there's a lot on this page for a stipend, but um, I think it kind of gets at the things that we're looking for them to do, whether it's um, working with teachers, developing guides and support materials. I'll, I'll um, around though, I don't know anything kind of about a fan of stipends, but my only concern is I don't want to pay somebody twice for doing something during the day. Nope. So, so the model looks, uh, it's kind of a hybrid. So obviously they would be fully engaged and fully employed during the regular school day. So in addition to the stipend, which would be for after school workshops, development of guides, um, you know, some professional development opportunities for teachers, we would like to provide them some release time from the classroom because I think that would be the most beneficial for other teachers in the building. There's no stipend attached with that. It's, you know, us getting a substitute, which um, at the elementary level actually happens pretty easily because there's often, you know, I'm going to take a half personal day, we have a sub for the whole day kind of thing. Um, I don't anticipate much cost to the classroom release piece at all. Okay. Um, and this, this stipend work would be truly for deliverable, quantifiable items like guides and professional yeah. development pieces. And it's not, is that something that we have to bargain in? Or is that something that can be added or just added to the list of stipends? Um, so it's not something that I would consider to be a retirement worthy stipend. It's one of those things that we post as an internal posting okay. for anyone that's right. interested. Thanks. And candidly, it's like this, I remember when we talked about the square base on model, it was really expensive. I it mean, is I, expensive. I'll be honest with you, when I sat on here, I'm like, I, I don't think they can afford it. I don't know how we do that. It is expensive. I would anticipate coming to you during the budget cycle next fall, winter, spring, with an IT department that looks remarkably different from what we have right now. But because yeah. we're in kind of a growing year, um, I think it's important to 
invest in some support for teachers, and I think the best use of that money is to identify yeah. point to people in each building. At this point, while we figure out what the right model for us as a district is and what we're trying to do. So support. it's an affordable way of getting it where we need to get to be It's a cheap way to get smart people. <laughs>